Hi everybody, this is Eric Enga. I am the CEO of Stone Temple Consulting. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Dave Rodecker of Relevant Ads. Uh, excited to have him on the show and we're going to talk about local search. Sounds like a good topic. So Dave, can you introduce yourself please? Hi, David Rodecker. I'm the CEO of Relevant Ads, and uh, I've been in online advertising since uh, 1999. I've been uh, I've done different local services. Uh, most recently, I was uh, prior to Relevant Ads. I uh, established Local.com, was a CTO, and got the search engine established and the, the website established. And uh, Relevant Ads is a local service uh, data management provider. Uh, we have as one of our products that we go to market as local splash. So thanks for being on the show, Eric. Uh, yeah, glad to glad to have you on. Uh, and yes, we're going to talk local search. It sounds like a great topic because I know a lot of people have this problem. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, which is most of you, uh, I got to know uh, Dave because we have com uh, uh, clients in common. Uh, so we work on on some different things. And it's really interesting when you dig into it, uh, um, there, there's sort of the advanced stuff, but a lot of what you have to do in local search comes down to some really basic fundamentals. Can you uh, start us off, uh, Dave, and just tell us what some of those are? Sure. Uh, well, you know, lo we've been in local search since 2006, and uh, uh, at Relevant Ads, we've seen the industry quite evolve quite a bit. What seemed to be a pretty simple um, arrangement of how data uh, flows through the internet has uh, become very complicated over time. And uh, uh, so it's been a very interesting um, ecosphere. Uh, some of people, I presume, have already seen how uh, the local data ecosystem has evolved and you have uh, core data providers, websites, search destinations. Um, a whole myriad of, of different data um, and functionalities, mobile applications are in the mix of things. Uh, we focus uh, pr uh, a lot on local SEO, so where search retrieval and maps listings come into play. And uh, uh, so it's been, it's a very interesting space. Things continue to be in flux. The search uh, engine is very different than the traditional search engine, so local SEO uh, is, is a completely different uh, uh, sort of notion versus the traditional web SEO. We are seeing a lot of things in blending of that, but uh, um, it's certainly an, a unique um, um, area to play in. Indeed. So I think uh, uh, let's actually take a moment and first define how you can recognize a local result versus a regular web search result. I think that's just to get people oriented. Spend like two minutes on that, and then sure. we'll figure on you know how we how we win at that game. Yeah, it's actually kind of a funny story. When we going back years, I remember first talking to a dentist and selling them on, "Hey, you got to be in local." And they said, "Well, how can I see this?" And so I actually took them and said, "Go to Google.com." And uh, back then, it, they didn't have hybrid results. Nowadays, you see this with hybrid results, but you had to go to more and even more, and then maps, and then then you could query within maps to get local results. Today, however. Um, and uh, starting several years ago, they started a blend in which if the intent of the query was local in nature or was an explicit local query like Flowers and Irvine, uh, you would see integrated into the search results a uh, maps pack listing. And that's evolved to a, what's called also a hybrid pack listing where you will get a blending of organic and uh, local maps results in the same search result set. So yeah, so I'm going to actually pop up an example here. Uh, so here uh, you see at the top of this set of search results, and I, I did an explicit query, uh, Dave. I typed in Framingham Dentist. So mm -hmm. you get these ads, and you can see these little yellow ad buttons. And then below that you see Framingham Dental Center, Framingham Math Dentist uh, Dental. Um, and that one is still a regular uh, traditional web search result. And then below this you see some of those uh, you know, local results or maps results, as we call them, right? Uh, right. And you can recognize them because you have, uh, um, you know, Framingham Dental Center, Framingham Dentist shows a number of stars, Google reviews, and then you have the address and phone number over on the right. So it pretty stands out pretty distinctly from the other results. 
Sure. And so this well, this got slowly indoctrinated, and, and as you just found, you did an a, a, a explicit search. Uh, this also works for implicit search query. So you could just type in pizza or flowers or dentist, and you'll get the same thing. And it's, it's how, at that point, Google is making an assumption based upon where you're located from several different pieces of information, your IP and, and geo coordinations and, and such. But the, um, the, the number of queries that, that deliver that sort of search result page has dramatically increased over time. Uh, when they first started introducing it slowly, they figured out where it was relevant and more meaningful, uh, and it grew from 12 to 20 to, I, uh, oh, they say over now, 30, I think it's 33% of queries have local intent. A lot of those queries, though, um, are coming not just from that, but also from mobile devices in which uh, uh, there's, there's uh, I think it's over 50% of queries have local intent on mobile. That's That's amazing. So... Um, that's a big part of what Google is trying to do, is they're trying to discern that local intent. And uh, as you said, when you do an explicit query, like you include the city name or your town name or wherever you live uh, uh, in there, uh, that, that makes it easy for Google. But uh, there's all these kinds of queries, pizza, dentist, uh, uh, you know, car rental, where you probably, you know, I'm sitting here in New York right now at the Click See Live conference, uh, if I type in pizza, I'm probably not looking for pizza in San Jose, right? So they'll give right. me that, that local stuff that I can like walk and go get, or a delivery person can bring to me. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. They figured a lot of that out. Uh, they started making that technology of where they could locate you. Um, a, lo a lot of that came when the Street View technologies came out, and they were. Um, seeing the Wi-Fi signals where people are located with a higher precision. So, uh, you know, when we did this uh, years ago at local.com, we would take an IP address and go, well, this person's in Los Angeles. And that is a pretty large range. You can't rely upon just IP information. So they, the geo-triangulations that Google's been able to do to more specifically isolate exactly where you're located, and they've got a really good precision on this in many cases. Um, and when they know that, they will, you know, give you what is um, you know more of a hyper local result set centered around where you're at, and they do the same thing on mobile as well. Uh, very often in SEO, we tend to focus on queries that are explicit in nature, and we may have a client, and we'll, we're just trying to see um, where they rank in search results. Dentist in Irvine is different than doing a query for dentist when you're in Irvine. And it's really diff really a, a strong differentiation because that's what the user is going to do. Moreover, with things like Google Instant um, and Auto Suggest, people are simplifying their queries. Yeah, and um, so to get this process started, right? You deal with uh, uh, Google Places and a verification process. Can you walk people through that? Sure. So business owners are. Uh, are able to essentially claim their listing in Google search. And they offer a full management platform that's called Google Places. And that's, kind of, that's gone through a different, few different formats in the, over the years. But essentially, it's the same idea. You go in, you say that you're this business. Uh, there's a verification process. At that point, they let you um, have control of the listing. Um, even when you don't have control, you can start drafting what they want, like you to do, which is including, of course, verifying your, what your business name is, the categories, uh, description, photos, hours of operation, and some other data elements to enhance your listing. And uh, then they go through a verification process, and uh, verification involves uh, sending a postcard or an email. Uh, you can even do bulk verification as a, an enterprise uh, for all your locations. Uh, and at that point, you have then um, gone through a verification. You, you essentially have the authority to um, make the content that shows within Google uh, plus local pages um, exactly what you would like it to be. So um, what happens, <coughs> excuse me, what happens when the, the, there are problems with the verification process? I mean, does that happen? Right. So. You know the, the 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 bigger landscape here is all the several sites offer a sort of verification process and allow you to claim a listing. So Google's not unique with this. And uh, challenges may come up though in which multiple people are claiming what is believed to be the same location. Uh, and the uh, different sites have different ways of taking care of this problem. 
Uh, for example, on uh, Yahoo, it's whoever's last claimed it pretty much owns it. On, um, on Google, for quite some time, they allowed for multiple owners. And they had a very interesting way in which they would masquerade some content of what each listing. Uh, over the years, that shifted in which they started to say, hey, we're looking for the right one. Uh, and they would moderate that and determine which one that is. At this point, they're very stringent about the fact that there needs to be a single owner for the business location. And uh, it's caused a lot. They've also applied this retroactively so that if you had a listing that you thought you had control of, go check. You may have lost that control. Uh, it may or may not be, even be evident. Sometimes it says it's an active listing, but it's actually not. If you won't go to make a change at that point, it'll say, you need to re-verify. Uh, they may tell you right on the right off the bat if it shows up on Google Plus. It says uh, a big red banner across the bottom that says your listing is blocked or suspended. Um, and so this is due to either they've identified that there's multiple claims, but there's a number of different issues that they might have with the way that you've listed your item, um, or if there's duplicate listings. Um, so it's created a lot of challenges for people, um, especially the small business owner, that may be blissfully unaware that these things, um, what to do, or even you know what they, sh even that they have a problem to take care of. So. What are, uh, sometimes I see, sorry, reformulating my question, sometimes I see these situations where you actually do get uh, multiple listings, which you, you can tell as a human, are for the same business, they have uh, kind of sort of almost the same address uh, uh, and phone number, and, and you're looking at it and you're saying, you know, what the heck, this doesn't make sense. How does that come about? <laughs> well, so going back to the... Okay, I know it wasn't... It question <laughs> no no but th this is uh, this is actually a real fundamental challenge in local uh, having uh, you know if you go back to the local ecosphere and all the sites commingling uh, the, uh, the because well, there is no single data source that says this is the data of the United States businesses uh, you know th this th there isn't that sort of aggregation that any one person or one entity has. Um, in many ways, AT&T could have been that if they weren't deregulated, but we don't have that benefit. So how do you know what real businesses exist today, which ones have come into existence, and which ones are no longer in existence? Uh, businesses don't typically call and say, hey, take me off the, the yellow page and the white page listings. We're closing our doors. They just go away. So you have an aging effect. And so one way that Google's taken advantage of this is said, well, if we haven't heard from you in a while, we're going to kind of presume you're not really doing too much business. You're certainly not doing too much new business. So that's a kind of a devaluing ranking factor and how they've handled it. Other places, though, like the core data providers, who are companies that that attend to the fact that they've aggregated all the business information. There's there's a handful of these. There's uh, Info Group, uh, Axiom, Locallys, uh, and companies like Factual are doing it from more of a data perspective of online uh, uh, information, whereas the other companies are kind of lead companies. But they have what they say is a full picture of US, United States businesses. Um, <clears throat> we actually did a study. Um, it's called Behind the Smoke. Um, uh, for the core data providers and found how much of their data actually matched each other. And um, it's pretty complicated, though, to even ask that question because you have to decide how you're matching. You na match on uh, what we refer to as NAP, the name, address, phone number. If you exactly try to match that, though, you have a lot of variations to how someone displays an address with normalization variances. Uh, and uh, so then you simplify and go, well, only, only if it has the same phone number. Uh, Google's taken a perspective in this in which they allow for potentially a business to have uh, you know multiple listings but the fact is does it is it really a unique establishment is it have its own unique address uh, you can have the same phone number but you have multiple addresses let's say because you have an 800 number or something of the sort uh, and uh, or let's say you have multiple businesses at the same address and um, they're completely different entities uh, so they allow for those things but there's a discretionary, you know, choice in some in some of these areas. Um, a lot of times, they actually rely upon the Street View imagery to make a decision as to which business is really here. And so uh, that does ha tend to make mistakes. There's flaws with that. Um, and you know, so they can algorithmically look at it in some ways, and then they also definitely have a human moderation element. So if I were to try to resummarize this, um, 
uh, and actually I'm going to add, uh, add a little bit to it, which is you, you have these people, Google one of them, but there's what you call the core data providers, like an info group or an Axiom or a Localese. They're all trying to get a complete listing of U.S. businesses. And it used to be that folks like Info USA, which is part of the info group, literally like would have phone books delivered and they would like go through the phone books and pull out the uh, uh, information and uh, people like Google may be crawling the web. The challenge is that the information is represented in slightly different ways uh, all over the web. So uh, I'm pretty sure they've all figured this out, but just to illustrate for people, uh, you know, did you put RD for road or did you spell out road? Now, they probably have figured That's that out now, but as, as Dave suggested a moment ago, you might have an 800 number. Uh, you might have a tracking phone number that you're using for one channel. Uh, you might have your normal phone number. You might have many phone numbers that you use. Um, so your NAP information might differ. Uh, you might have, it might show on the web four or five different ways, right? And, and Google might uh, pull all of that into, um, uh, they might pull all of those records in because, uh, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of what you're getting at. Um, definitely, definitely the case. They, uh, you know, their statistics as to, you know, about 20 million U.S. businesses. Um, it's been crawled a few times, but the number of places within Google, which includes things beside businesses like parks and such, but um, it's, you know, factors of 10 more than that number. Uh, so they definitely are, you know, seeing a bunch of chatter out there about a bunch of businesses that may be long gone, uh, and they've kind of simulated that up to refining it more and more, and they continue to do that. So that's why we get back into this verification uh, challenges, and, and uh, um, it's, uh, it's, re it, it's, it's been um, an experience to see how, you know, different entities are handling this, Google being one of them, and uh, the quality control, though, definitely is, is a big reason for verification challenges, and uh, uh, that's... Uh, uh, still, though, a very oblique thing because they, uh, while Google has done a lot of benefits in, in figuring this out, they've also created a lot of mistakes. And there are a lot of lo a lot of cases that we've seen that it's just a blatant uh, mistake within the Google system, whether it be human or, or, or um, uh, algorithmically done. Um, they do offer some support channels, which uh, has, you know, through email as well as phone, in which you can try to deal with these, but it continues to be a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the questions we have, I, I think several people have been asking it. Uh, Tina Willis is one of those. Uh, uh, and I'm going to uh, just, uh, oops, sorry, wrong thing from Tina. Uh, Tina, I was trying to, oh, there we go, this one. Uh, uh, what else will help us, you know, beyond traditional SEO factors? So, but now that we've been talking about the data mess, uh, I think one of the big ranking factors in local search is what you can do to clean up your own mess, right? Sure. So, uh, name ad I mentioned NAP, name, address, phone number. That's like a you know one on one oh one basic thing that you've got to get clear. You, even though 800 numbers can be used, we prefer to see a localized number. There's a few different reasons for that, but. Uh, you don't want to have a tracking number. You want to have the same phone number consistent across everything. And you use, uh, on your own website, on every site that you know of that refers to your business, we also call a citation, and certainly your, your verified Google uh, Places uh, page. So the uh, the NAP information is is uh, uh, pretty much a one on one hundred one. There are services that help you in uh, taking care of that to broadcast that that NAP across everything. Um, like the core data providers, um, and uh, uh, there are uh, there's the Yexts. Uh, Moz offers a solution for the core data providers as well, <clears throat> and uh, so that's a you know kind of a basic l layer thing that um, you've got to get a clean understanding of. Uh, we refer to that as audit. We will do a NAP audit and just see how how widecast is the correct information or incorrect information, and and also the business listing altogether. Uh, so. That's uh, uh, but going to you know how how do we talk about ranking SEO factors? Uh, there's a whole genre of things that uh, relate to that. So just in, like in with as with organic and web SEO, you look at page rank as a factor and what fundamental things can you do to you know attribute to that. Uh, we've 
in an industry we've coined a phrase that's uh, like place rank, and that is um, essentially factors that we, you know, have found that contribute to increasing a place's ranking. Uh, these are things like uh, I mean, the, uh, the uh, attributes of the business, where it's located, um, the how close it is in proximity to the user, um, the uh, centroid of a city, um, the business name, which um, can actually be altered within Google to a certain fidelity, what we call the descriptor. Uh, um, so there's kind of two major fun fundamental factors, those that are within Google places and the claiming and the listing itself and uh, things that are outside of that. And that includes your own web pages, your own, um, you know, all the other citations. Um, um, and also it's kind of a gray area is your own plus page and the reviews you get into that. Uh, so we can talk in quite detail on several of those um, for each one of those. Uh, for the you know purposes of simplicity, that's how we've divided it. And uh, uh, I think it's why uh, valuable to look at. You, most people think that we've done our Google Places listing and it's good enough in and its own. But the thing is, there's a lot of tuning aspects that um, used to exist in the old dashboard. There's a new dashboard now, um, and um, there's a lot of discretionary choices, as I mentioned, categories, um, mm -hmm. business descriptor, uh, images, uh, and the description of the business. Uh, so those are, you know, kind of the fundamentals. Yeah, and uh, just to help people understand, um, so when, when Dave's talking about consistency of listings, right? From Google's perspective, if they see, you know, certain data in uh, Google Places. And then they crawl Yelp and Super Pages uh, and Yellow Pages and and each of these places they see different information. Google recognizes that a lot of business owners have trouble with keeping this information up to date, and what it causes them to do is lose confidence in the data. And Google is really deathly afraid that when someone clicks on that local search result or sees that local search result that they're going to call the phone number and get, uh, you know, this uh, number has been disconnected, uh, or they drive to that location and they find a blank storefront. They're deathly afraid of that. So they treat this data consistency problem as, well, a ranking factor. Right? That's true. Uh, definitely the case. And it's, I mean, for all those reasons you just mentioned, so it's, it almost seems like a... Uh, uh, I mean, it's definitely for the user intent. Uh, if a business is switching around, moving around, or no longer exists, they are not paying attention to their data, uh, those are negative influential factors for sure. So having the con consistency, though, also allows them to, it's not just that they want to bias against you because of that, uh, having that consistency allows them to match these pages. So uh, a citation is any you know other website that essentially Google's indexed and associated uh, to a location, and they'll do that more easily um, if, more readily, if they've got the same name, address, phone number. So you want to be able to allow them to have as many reasons to give you that higher place rank. As possible, yeah. Uh, can you just describe a little bit the difference between citations uh, and uh, links? Sure. So just like a, cita a link within uh, web results creates a you know increase in, in page rank calculation for another web page, uh, a uh, citation is essentially an attribution of a, a place uh, from another website. So you could have a yellowpages.com uh, page that talks about your business. Google sees that that page is referring to your business and uh, they all the content associated, they want to index, and so there and thereby they essentially take that page, associate it to your place, increasing the, um, the retrieval and potentially the optimization for um, it because it has a uh, um, a value in that linkage. So a citation is when they've clearly been able to figure out that this page has to do with your business, even though it doesn't have a link even though there's no link at all. Uh, but the fact that it mentions your business, and simply, it's sometimes as simple as a phone number, uh, there's markup that the, a, lot of, a lot of sites use for um, allowing meta tags to describe that as well. So it can, sometimes doesn't have to be obviously stating name, address, phone number um, in order to do that. Yeah, no, so that's very cool. So those, 
citations for your local business are really powerful and useful to get. Definitely. Uh, when we see those, though, the it used to be years ago that you would see what these citations were in a more info section on an old version of Google uh, Maps. And uh, so it was really insightful. You could see the 87 different places on the web that they found your your list, your uh, your business, and they have some association to your business. And while they still see all those, they they tuned down displaying it. And it was somewhere in the time that they got in, in a big argument and tiff with Yelp um, over displaying reviews. So they decided, hey, you know what, we won't continue to represent, even though we see that and we know it's associated with this listing and we're going to probably have it still as metadata to retrieval within Google search index, they don't display it anymore. So we're left to discover how Google finds it and, and it, what citations they believe are still valuable and relevant. Um, what we did see though before uh, even the, the citations that they would include were not just every place that had your business. It had to have your business and have something unique about it. Couldn't just be, you know, here's name, address, phone number, and you've got a listing on, you know, superpages.com. It's got to be superpages.com has description, reviews, maybe some photos, extended content. It's got to be also unique because if that page is the exact same page as the page on yellowpages.com, uh, we already know that Google tends to get rid of duplicate content, so they're going to take the most unique or the whichever one they feel is more relevant. So in assessing citations, there's a lot of different places out there um, that discuss citations. Like um, Moz has a great directory which shows per vertical the citations they see as most prevalent. Um, and um, so if you're a uh, church, for example, I found out local.com is a great resource for being a citation. Um, and uh, so per, per industry and vertical, some destinations are more popular to be on. So it, it's, it's not just the fact that it has relevant, useful content. Maybe they have some sort of feature or functionality or popularity. So um, that's what we look for is, is uh, citations or websites that either have a good you know, user traction on their own or they have a unique uh, functionality or, or uh, display of content that li we'd like to take advantage of, um, which kind of boils down to metrics, if you were to look at it, Alexa and PageRank. Um, so that's, uh, those are places to, just, to look for citations. Awesome. So I'm just going to jump back and pick a couple of questions I skipped over because of the flow of the discussion. Uh, so Colin Ball here. Uh, 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 caught your uh, figure about 50% of search being local. Uh, you were referring that to mobile, right? Specifically, is that right? Right. So, the you know they they produce a Zeitgeist every year, and my recollection was last that it was around 33% uh, or close to 40% across the board for local intent queries. But definitely on mobile, it was more than 50. It may have been 70. I really I. I don't know the, the I don't have the resource on that immediately, um, but I know a few places that we get it from, and I can probably link it in the show after the uh, after the show. I should say. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a it's a big number either way. That's for sure. I mean, it's huge. Yes, it's been a major progression. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, it, it's it was kind of it when we got into local and, and business uh, data management. Um, I always thought it was you know going to be something that is used, but the fact that you know, I mean, search, I think, you know, going back a decade, nobody realized how profound that would be. Local search is really just one on one and one with search now. Um, even though it has all these different fundamental algorithms to it, um, it is, it's what users are looking for. And uh, especially whether or not we're on a mobile device, we want to find things that are relevant to us. That's mostly going to be local. Uh, we already know they've done things to index on a national scale. They've actually brought that down so the indexes are, are very localized. So it's, uh, I think it's all the progressions going to more and more local. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, uh, Linda, uh, Linda Heffernan wants to know about uh, um, you know, how good the Moz service is, if you have any experience, direct experience with that. Well, okay, so Moz is, the Moz service is essentially looping in all the core data providers, um, a couple others. The thing about the core data providers, we work with them directly, and um, it's difficult. They have the same problems that we've already been discussing that Google deals with. They got the same problems. 
they've got a, a database that has a bunch of listings in it, and then they continue to get a flux of new data in all the time, which, as you mentioned, they literally get some of that from the printed yellow page books. I uh, remember Amit Khanna at uh, InfoGroup would literally telling me that they would collect these all and transcribe all the yellow page book records, um, and that's the that's the basic essence of it. They're getting better about cleaning up their data, but they've got a considerable amount of dupes, misclassified listings, etc. And um, even when you submit the data to them, you say, "Hey, this is the correct data." Uh, very often, they end up just adding that, keeping the old data there to uh, essentially, you know, age, or hopefully it might blend in some way, but they don't give you a very good control of saying, this is the record I see in your database, and I want to modify it to say this. Uh, in some cases, a couple of them do, but it's a, you know, send it and forget it. Uh, you don't really get feedback, and that's, you know, that, that's the challenges with it. That being said, if you're a new business, you want to come out, and you want to make sure it's there, um, that's a great place to, to go. We look at it as a um, uh, kind of an emergency case scenario. We don't typically use those unless we find the, a strong need to. Years ago, that wasn't the case. We actually started this business with only dealing with the core data providers. But in time, the destinations are trusting other sources of information, and they realize that. The um, uh, an Another thing about that is even when you submit your data to these core data providers, the people who subscribe to them, which is the the ecosphere of all these other local sites um, uh, are licensing that data. However, in many cases, they don't refresh it, or if they do, they do it very sparingly. The it's a real challenge that I'm going to send you a CD that's full of you know 20 million records. I get and uh, you're going to import all that. You're going to take your user content. You're going to take whatever else you want to throw on there, and then next month I'm going to send you the CD again. And then you've got to make a decision <clears throat> how you do all that match up, and you've had your record already overwritten, uh, and it's a real logistical challenge. Many sites do not um, refresh as a result of it. We we know firsthand um, uh, at uh, Yelp that they who they subscribe to Axiom, um, they actually only did a single snapshot uh, when they first started. They redid it a couple years later, and it was a disaster. Um, so they've just opted to, although they continue to license Axiom, they don't do a refresh. So it's uh, uh, dealing with a tool like Moz is a uh, good way to cover them all if you want to cover them. We cover, we do that in about 10% of cases, and these are more challenging cases or cases where a lot of switching has occurred um, and some other anomalies that may be the case. So just to make sure everybody's clear, because I want I want the, the audience to understand this ecosystem a little better. Um, so um, we have uh, uh, many kinds of people keeping this data. We have uh, sites that we all know, like Yelp and Superpages and YellowPages.com, uh, and those are out there, and they have all these somewhat complete listings uh, of data, including many dupes and uh, old records and all that, right? And then on top of that, you, we have what you're calling these core data providers. So here, here's my yellow page sites here. And on top of that, we have these core data providers, which are, really aren't about publishing their own website, but they're about collecting the best possible information, then supplying that to everybody else, right? So that's the axioms and the local eases and the info groups and uh, those kinds of stuff, with one of the people getting that data being the search engines. Um, and it, it becomes an interesting problem because the, um, all the data sources are actually messed up. And they're all feeding each other, which, you know, hopefully at the end of the day uh, is resulting in somebody ending up a little bit less messed up. But, you know, you highlighted it beautifully. I think you said there's how many 20-some-odd million businesses in the U.S.? And Give or take. It depends on number, whose number you trust. And, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of these businesses are in flux. There's a, there's a, there is a large turnover of new businesses. Uh, a lot of individual, you know, uh, proprietors that start a business, they do the right things, maybe they incorporated even, uh, they did an SMB or they got a phone number, um, and that's that's how easy it is to get into these things sometimes. Um, new business phone connections will be registered, uh, and these guys pick it up. Um, at, you know, the info group and um, uh, locallys do, very, do that very well. Axiom does a lot of crawling for their data, but uh, so... But those businesses tend to exist for maybe even just a few months, and then they go out of business. Uh, uh, 
there's been a few studies on that, and it's we see a lot of turnover in new businesses. So uh, there's a huge amount of businesses that have been around for many years. That's probably you know less than 50% of them, um, and most of these businesses are SMBs, you know, one to five person shops. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so that's that's the uh, the furball, as I like to refer to it, of uh, uh, of local business uh, data. And a, a frightening problem uh, uh, it represents for sure. Um, uh, what about uh, uh, you know reviews? What role do they play in this process? Yeah, so reviews have um, uh, long been debated as to how they you know portray into the local search algo. Uh, at times, we've seen it have more of an impact um, and or at least perceived impact by some of our measures. Uh, a couple of specific things of, of value that uh, we have there. Uh, there there's, I mean, we really do need to look at reviews in two different ways. We've got Google reviews and then all the other reviews. Um, it used to be that all the other, uh, all the reviews in total were all that we needed to focus on. But, uh, uh, and it was good. You go out and get, uh, it's one way of, of helping a, a website become a citation. So an insider pages placement, for example, uh, just has name, address, phone number, but you get a couple of reviews on it, and now it's behaving like a citation. Um, so when you get that review, the fact that it has additional content is great, uh, and those terms, if they're very unique, might portray into the re uh, might take a factor in how the listing it has in uh, retrieval. So if it has a specific niche keyword like a uh, um, you know, a dentist, of course, saying dentist all over the review isn't probably not going to do much, but if it has a term like porcelain veneers, that could portray into how that business might be retrieved. So um, rich keywords, extended long tail keywords have some uh, uh, benefit there. With respect to reviews on Google, they, they now don't display reviews from the rest of the web. They used to actually display those. Uh, now they will link to, there's more reviews on insider pages. In some cases, they'll do that. Um, so they, we know they've been tuning back how much they display that. They definitely get it, though. Another, another indication of where they're getting this, uh, or the fact that they are getting this, is they, will, they are now displaying um, to a business in the Places dashboard all their reviews that, that Google finds. And, um, uh, but those are separate from the ones that they say are reviews on Google. Reviews on Google are valuable for probably all the reasons I already mentioned for search retrieval, but the another factor is they'll display those star reviews on under the listing within the, the local maps pack and the, and the search results there. So it's one of those factors that we know that could increase your click-through rate when someone sees the number of reviews from Google uh, and the stars right there. Yeah, I've actually heard it said that um, uh, you get a higher click-through rate if you have uh, bad reviews and if you have no reviews. Yeah, having something is better than nothing is, is another adage for that, I suppose. And it's really an eye of the beholder. It depends who you're talking to, I suppose. But having more flair probably is a good thing altogether. Yeah. So, so far, I mean, we've covered kind of two, uh, well, we've covered many topics. But just to take, uh, to try to uh, create some, some takeaways. Uh, the first part, we talked about the, the data furball at length. And, um, uh, you know, for those of you who are watching, I think the takeaway out of that part was um, you have to do your part to get the data cleaned up. And there's various services that can help you with that. Um, you can go to these so-called core data providers, Axiom, Locales, Infogroup. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, services uh, 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 you know, for the right business, you do some of this work with relevant ads, right, uh, right, Dave? Yeah, that's true. So what we do in going about a uh, that process is is an audit, actually. So rather than just doing this spray paint effect of hey, we want to cover X, Y, and Z, um, and all those those areas, we're more delicate and precise about it. Um, that technique, when done, often will create more of a problem. If you just say, I'm going to go to Moz, I'm going to go to Yax, I'm going to go to this site and this site, you actually could create a ton of different dupes. Um, and as, as one of the things about citations, by the way, is that Google tends to want a single citation for your business uh, for a given site. It is um, 
uh, like a yellow page listing, you should have, if you have multiple of them there and there's a duplicate, they may end up associating the duplicate page, which kind of sucks as compared to another page. So you don't want to have this duplicate occur. Uh, you want to have a true authoritative one. And, and uh, so all your citations, um, you want to be clean. You don't want to create dupes, that's for sure. Uh, so what we do, though, before going out there and even you know saying, hey, we're going to cover all these things, we're we going to find out where it's currently at what sites know about this business already. So we'll do an audit. And an audit is kind of difficult to do. You've got to figure out where your business exists even when Google doesn't know it exists. Um, so hopefully they've indexed it, uh, but we actually do this quite extensively. We've got about 100 different sites that we will do um, deep queries on, and we'll query them specifically for the business name um, uh, but we'll, we you can't just do the business name. It's fairly too generic. So we'll do business name plus zip, just the phone number, business name plus street address. Uh, so a few different permutations such that we can find all the footprint of this want this business. We'll see wh how many duplicates occur, uh, which one we want to consider as the primary, and try to figure out how to eliminate the other ones. And it's that how to eliminate the other ones that's really unique per destination. You can't just go and talk to Info Group about a problem with Yahoo listings. You've got to go to Yahoo and talk to them about their duplicates. So um, the uh, uh, this is one which we spend a lot of time making sure that we've got a clean audit, and then that drives the, the, the rest of the work and the food chain of how to solve the problem. So, that, so really what's going on there uh, is you're, you're discovering which sites the problems are coming from, and you might be dealing with any, any a dozen or 20 different sites that are contributing to this problem, and you've got to take them on one by one. Right, yes. Yeah, and so this is all done. Um, th th that's all a precursive stage. If um, We'll do that before even getting involved with um, trying to find new ones because the best way to take advantage of getting a citation is to go after a page that already exists and make it better versus just make a new page. Right, so you're you're correcting it essentially. Correct. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and then so that's that's the the data part. There's this labor-intensive process, and um, uh, for for the audience, that's a miserable answer because they're looking for a simpler way to deal with this. And unfortunately, uh, the reality is it's not simple. Uh, it's a it's a painful process. But that that's part one: is get your data squared away. Uh, and, and Dave just did a really great job of uh, explaining how you've kind of, you know, site by site, got to figure out where your problems are. Um, and then, uh, and then there's the review side of things, uh, which is a way of, um, at the very least, uh, getting some visibility in the search results if it's a Google review uh, for the fact that you have reviews. Uh, maybe getting some uh, additional citations and data for yourself. Uh, so those seem to be like the two major elements that we've talked about so far. Right. And, and also uh, how searchers are, are searching and implicit queries. Um, one, one thing I wanted to make sure that, that everyone knows is it's really, you can, if, you're, if you're helping a business, you're doing uh, SEO work for them, and they are in a different area or they have a different location that you're searching, that you're optimizing for, um, you can emulate that. Uh, that location, and, and even though you're currently in New York, uh, you could essentially tell, provide a search tool, uh, uh, and it's a search tool option within Google to essentially mimic as is as if you were in a different location without having to implicitly identify that within your query. And and what what's the scenario in which you use that? So, if I wanted to send you a pizza, um, I could go. Uh, to my browser and essentially share um, or identify uh, myself as on Google. If I just do a search for pizza right now, um, uh, then it's going to give me local uh, local places for pizza. And uh, um, I'll actually demonstrate this here. On my browser right now, I did pizza. Interestingly enough, it's doing pizza near Lexington, Kentucky. Um, I must have been doing a set test before, but instead I'll do, um, uh, if you knew your zip code, I would type that in directly, but I'll just pretend your zip code 10001, uh, somewhere in New York, and now I'm getting pizza places right next to you. So I could call John's Pizzeria, 
and uh, tell them to send a pizza right on up to you. And of course, you can also see this it uses to see what your listings look like uh, uh, in your other locations, which aren't currently that close to you. So, right. So again, that's right here under it's uh, next to the web maps. The more there's search tools and a little drop down to set your location to something different. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So, um, what about uh, you know Bing and and Yahoo? Uh, you know, a few, few years ago when they, uh, uh, Bing and Yahoo um, had their search arrangement, we thought that they would combine and make a, a cool thing for local. Or they would decide on one de search versus the other. They actually didn't do that. They both kept their own individual local programs. And, uh, uh, and in many ways, we thought that that would stimulate some things. I heard from both of those companies that they would be improving things dramatically. It's taken a lot longer. We've seen some improvements in uh, the Bing dashboard. So just like Google has their you know, places dashboard, Bing also has that. Um, and it's got, got quite some interesting, unique functionalities. I don't think they've taken off um, as they quite the, as they expected. Like you can print a QR code for your business um, was one of them in the past. They also went about saying uh, on Bing, they said, tell us your categories, but then give us your percentage relevancy for each. Yep. And uh, you had to kind of decide. So it wasn't hard enough to figure out your categories. Now you had to decide how to, to balance them. Uh, well, and, I'm 100% um, for all of them. <laughs> yes, and, and I think they automatically made the other one come back if you, you chose to do that. Uh, but oh, uh, Clear your screen share, by the way. Um, sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, so so they... Uh, so the the dashboard though is uh, is pretty nice over there with Yahoo. Uh, theirs has is um, I mean when 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 uh, they got a new CEO a few years ago, uh, we were also hopeful that they would see some improvements. She actually mostly put a stop to anything new. Um, they focus on mobile, but they the local um, is as of recent. It's it's had a lot of problems. Um, the verification process is similar for Yahoo, in which they will, it used to just be email, but now they will send postcards. And um, we're getting a lot of postcards not sent. We're seeing a lot of postcards uh, sent with no printing on them. So the pin place, or they, maybe they ran out of ink, but this was, uh, th this are, th they clearly are uh, not supporting it as well as um, um, we'd like to see it. So, and also, it's while it is relevant for users, a lot of people uh, do use it. It's it's clearly the the lead right now with Google in terms of um, not only search but local search. Yeah. So, a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, um, so, uh, Jason Stovall wants to know if you're using some type of optimized SEO templates to help rank uh, local businesses. We, uh, well, it's a template might mean a web template, but uh, uh, I might, I actually prefer to interpret that question as a, a SEO process. Uh, we've, we've really thought about it as an SEO process, and we made an assembly line by how which uh, we will curate and, and look at listings and optimize them. Um, so we'll take a business profile, and we have a whole process on how we gather that through, through uh, uh, the elements we want to see. But then for every destination we work with, we have someone who focuses in putting those uh, and in, uh, in curtailing the content just for each destination because we want to make every one of them unique. Um, so one of those outlets is ha it has been um, for us is creating a web page uh, or a dedicated landing page. We've referred to this as a geo-targeted landing page because it will be a domain or a page on a directory that uh, that we've um, curated. Uh, and uh, those are template driven, I suppose, uh, uh, at their their nature. But we're we're populating with all that content in uh, in a unique way. Um, and but it is a very good value in doing that because if a business has their own website or doesn't have their own website, uh, even if they do have their own website, it may not be optimal for local. There's there's a benefit to us switching to that template page because it has the correct optimized name address phone number and it corroborates the business in a better way than the business's you know own website does uh, it may not be as ideal for conversion and that's something of a different notion to optimize for but uh, for local SEO ranking um, that is something that we have implored I would say that you don't 
whereas in the past we actually saw a lot of benefits in doing that, uh, we have seen much more benefit in utilizing a business's own website and making that more optimal these days. Um, but that's a challenge, is how do you get the business to update its site? They may not have that, even the, the login for that, and there's a lot of challenges when dealing with SMBs. Um, but even in the enterprise world, where they may have um, they may have their site not optimized well at all, even though they have this big website, their local location page, their landing page for each desk, their each uh, each of their listings landing pages are not optimal, and you'll get a better ranking benefit by not using that, instead using a, a templated page in some cases, which isn't where you want to go, but uh, it's just a balance between are we going to do this to increase our ranking um, and uh, you know a, a short-term versus a long-term strategy. Yeah. So um, another question, this one's from David Graham. Uh, is there some expectation that the use of organization or local business schema markup will help improve the data set in some way? Well, sure. The, um, in, in, uh, by applying some of that markup, uh, you create a better chance that, uh, that it will be identified as a citation because there's a very clear indication of this is the name, the address, this is the phone number. You can even put the latitude, longitude, which is really what Google's patent of identifying pages is associated to those elements. Uh, so if you had a page that talked all about the business um, and um, wasn't really trying to reinforce the, the NAP information, you could def you, I would definitely recommend putting it in there in some construct for the uh, schema markup. So it's just a matter of making it clear that this page is associated to the business. Um, and it doesn't have to be done through markup, but that's certainly one way to go about it. Yeah, and one of the problems with markup is it it suffers the same problem that all the data source problems uh, suffer, which is, is it being kept up to date by whoever put it there? Uh, constant challenge. Uh, so if you do use it, uh, make sure that you're very diligent about keeping it up to date. That will matter a lot. Um, for sure. Um, one more question, then I'm going to pop up. Uh, best practice for a retail chain in terms of having a local page and also a brand page. And this is from Krishna D. Uh, sure. Actually, Eric, uh, I don't see that for some reason the uh, that stale. But um, the um, ah, I see it now. Local brand page, also a brand page. So brand is definitely a much stronger signal. Um, and uh, so within a brand. Uh, own website, we're going to want to take advantage of a local page uh, that talks about that specific location. Uh, almost always, that's going to be the preferred scenario. In some cases where you know you can't do that, or it's an individual franchisee, let's say, uh, making their own page is certainly a good you know uh, it, it does work, and it's a uh, option that uh, a lot of businesses take. Uh, and so it really comes down to, are you going to be able to control that main brand's website and their landing pages? Because if you can, that's your win. You want to have that, that strongest signal site as your, as your uh, uh, landing page domain. Yeah, fair enough. So uh, uh, we're, we're almost at the end, and I actually have to be moderating a panel uh, of 25 story, uh, stories down uh, in just about 10 minutes. So... Uh, I always like to give my speakers a, a chance to make some closing comments, uh, you know, with the show. Um, so uh, do you have any closing thoughts that you wanted to share with people? Um, sure. Um, I guess I have uh, – uh, I'll go, try to race through it as quick as possible, but I have probably about four points that I think that should be touched upon um, that we didn't. The, uh, uh, one really unique thing is called Insights. Um, within the uh, places management, uh, we have uh, a tab that's called Insights. And a lot of people who want more an an information about how is local doing and, and getting some results out of it, um, this is what it deals with. Google Analytics, if you recall, used to always show you the keyword that organically triggered uh, hits to your site. Um, about a year ago, that started going away or, and, and because they've gone to secure search. And um, so you really don't know what keywords are driving traffic to your business organically. Insights gives you this. 
and it's really powerful information to see not only who what si what keywords are triggering hits to your business but you actually can see the keywords that tr that actually just retrieved your business to be shown within Google search results so um, for all the SEOs out there and search marketers, if you want to get better intelligence as to you know organic keywords, that's the place to go. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, you know and so along the thread of tracking results, a lot of people are tempted to throw uh, call tracking phone numbers. You can't do that on your Google Places listing, but if you put it on your website, you can do it with a JavaScript uh, rendering layover. Uh, just make sure it's done in a way that uh, you're definitely still displaying the true NAP information on your site. Uh, one thing that we also do is put in a tracking code into the URL of the business listing. So the business listing um, website URL is, you know, yourdomainname.com. You can actually put a hashtag and a campaign ID or something behind that. Word of caution, though, that doesn't always take effect. In some search results, it does. When they blend it, though, with hybrid search results, it may may end up getting um, trumped by the organic uh, indexed search page versus the um, the one you've applied in places. Uh, so that's along the notion of you know tracking results and such. I will mention that uh, recently we had we've never been able to see and measure you know what is the value of local just by itself if you you know had to question that or, or value that. Uh, we recently had a, a great case example come up where a um, uh, a large business um, who uh, uh, lost their got de-indexed because of uh, of um, compliance issues with uh, uh, Google. Uh, all of their website was de-indexed. They had no organic placement. Local listings, though, remained strong, and that was the only thing they had. Uh, they were still getting eight to ten leads per location per day, thousands across their their um, all their locations, and so literally local kept the the light on for them. And uh, so it's a it's a, those are rare examples though for us to be able to measure that, but it's really a huge thing. A couple of interesting tips that I might mention too uh, is uh, we uh, will take the uh, image optimization as another factor. Um, there's this thing called EXIF, uh, which is extended metadata within a photo or an image. Uh, when you take a photo with your uh, uh, phone, it encodes it with uh, geographic information, the latitude, longitude, and um, we have a tool that also does that. Um, in fact, I'll link it in there, but if you go to relevantads.com slash tools, we have an EXIF optimization um, uh, tool. And another interesting tool is categorization. So given a query on Google or in Yahoo, we have a tool that identifies what are the top categories of listings that rank for that query. So it really helps businesses that, or you, to go, hey, I don't know what to classify this guy as. You don't know the category structure of Google and Yahoo. Um, and they change those structures. So rather than you guessing, let's go see for the businesses that are ranking for that query, um, what categories they're in, and we look at that and the popularity of those, so it's a recommendation tool for categories. So that's about the, the main tips I wanted to cover. Am I uh, still on with you, Eric? Oh. I think he uh, went mute, actually. Or I did. Can people hear me now? I hear okay. you, Eric. Yep. Okay. So sorry about that, everybody. I don't know what happened. Uh, it was just one of those hang out on air things. It kind of popped me off <laughs> the mic. But in any case, I'm very much at the wire. Uh, I am going to have to bolt. Uh, Dave, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Uh, hopefully people found uh, uh, value for this. Um, we are going to follow up with questions. It's going to be many hours for me because I am going to do a panel and then fly home, but I will hop into the comments later. Dave will probably jump in a little sooner. Uh, Mark Traphagen, who's managing the Plus Stone Temple Consulting uh, uh, comments here for us, uh, uh, will probably jump in. Uh, Dave, thanks so much for joining us today. 
Uh, this is the Digital Marketing Excellence Show, shining off, shining off, and signing off for for the day. Bye, everybody. Nice. <laughs>